Hey. All right. Tales of a Cock Podcast, Episode Seven. Here we go. Lucky number seven. Lucky number seven. One of my favorite movies of all time. Booyah I'm Kasha. Sitting here with my main man, one of my favorite people on this earth, Mr. Rex Nelson. We are sitting in the backyard of my parents' house. First time ever on this podcast. We're sitting here drinking beer. First time ever on this podcast. Firestone Union Jack. Firestone Union Jack, man. That's a good shout out. We're always drinking tea on this podcast. This is the first. I like it. This is a uh, this is the rated R, twenty one and over <laughs> podcast. Is it serve alcohol? <laughs> yeah. So man, I'm glad you're here, Rex Nelson. You're my oldest friends in the world. We went to middle school together. You came in. I hated your guts. Naturally. And somewhere along the way, we locked eyes. So did most people. <laughs> <laughs> but I came here, called you today here today, man, because I just had a fucking adventure in Toronto this weekend. Yes, and I saw but about five seconds of it through a Snapchat of you sending me a WWE <laughs> because you couldn't get UFC on. Yeah, Saturday was one of the biggest UFCs ever. Yeah, but who was wrestling? <laughs> I can tell you, man. The Big Show was on there. Okay, I mean, that's... Uh, I mean, There's a couple guys I recognize. Triple H came in. Yeah. You know, beat up. He's champion again. You see a little... Ra- any Rey Mysterio? No Rey Mysterio. This is Raw, though. Rey Mysterio's never big on Oh, you're Raw. right. You're right. It was Monday Night Raw on a Saturday night. I guess that's a cause to be celebrated. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was trying to watch the UFC, man, because the UFC was on Fox Sports this weekend. Like, they always... They, they do it uh, in a very clever way where they show some fights on the internet. Yeah. On their, like, the Netflix-type service. Right. And they show some fights on Fox Sports, and they show the main card on pay-per-view, which I was going to go watch it at Hooters, which okay. I did, and it was awesome. Wait, so you – okay. So you were not able to find it in your hotel room, so you had to go outward and find it? Well, that was the whole plan anyway. But um, what happened, man, is I have a buddy in Toronto, my good buddy Taylor, yeah. who I met – at a kickboxing academy in Thailand. I stayed there for about two months, trained, got kicked in the head and left. Nice. But Taylor spent a long time there. He had like a couple fights. Badass dude. <laughs> so we met up in Toronto. Um, we smoked some joints on the streets of Toronto. Which is legal, right? Uh, it's legal-ish. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's it's like um, smoking the joints in San Francisco, right? I guess so, yeah. Right. Or brown bagging in San Francisco. <laughs> is that okay? Yeah, actually. You just bra- do that? Yeah, like... When I went up to San Francisco this past New Year's, like, one of the days, my battery's like, yeah, like, we're just going to get this bottle of sake, we're going to brown bag it and walk down to, like, where you can see Alcatraz. So, okay. Yeah, it's... And it, so I guess that's the same thing, where it's not Pretty, legal, pretty equivalent. But yeah, yeah. yeah. Kind of like in Denver. Like, it's, you know, it's legal, but you're not supposed to smoke outside, but yeah. people kind of do it anyways. Yeah, so we did that on the way to the UFC. It's did, like drinking at the beach, did, did, you know? Did you, did you watch the UFC this weekend? No, did I didn't. I heard... Oh, okay, I heard about it. What'd you hear? I heard that... Tell me everything that happened. Uh, besides the fact that Conor McGregor had to eat his words. Conor McGregor ate some words? I think you told me this, but I think, I'm pretty sure you did tell me this, actually, that Nate Diaz has 20 pounds on Conor McGregor. Um, they weighed in at the same amount. Yeah. So for this fight, it was not an issue, but in the past, Nate Diaz has fought at 170, he's fought at 155. What does he consistently fight at? 155. And but Conor McGregor fights at 145. He's a 145 pound champion. Is that is he consistently fight at 145, or is that he's going until like, this time? Yeah. Until this time. But the plan was to go up to 155 and fight the champion Dos Anjos. Yeah. But he got injured 11 days before. Oh, excuse me, I'm burping because of this beer. It's chill, dude. So Dos Anjos got injured. Nate Diaz stepped in. Yeah. And the story they were telling was that Nate Diaz, he's never out of shape. He does triathlon. Yeah. No problem. He's in cardio. Aerobic mat like beast, right? After the fight, though. Yeah. Nate Diaz is posting these pictures, these videos of him taking shots in Cabo. <laughs> like, yo, actually, I wasn't drinking. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. That just makes his victory over Conor McGregor like twice as good as it's it was. It's amazing, yeah, man. No, it like, was amazing. That's One wild. of the best fights I've seen. It was a great fight. Conor McGregor fucked him up the first round. Yeah. Got in there, destroyed him, threw some cool kicks, uh, landed some big punches. Yeah. Conor McGregor's a power puncher, right? Yeah. If he hits you with the left hand, you're dead. Nate Diaz is not like that. He throws a lot of punches that are not thrown that hard. Yeah. He throws 50% punches. One thing that I was reading about was, you know, Conor McGregor is a southpaw, right? Yeah. And Nate Diaz is also a southpaw. Right. That's a factor. Which, and one thing is that Conor McGregor, he kind of 
utilizes the fact that he's a southpaw as an advantage. as an advantage over a lot of you know just normal box normal. Yes. And the fact that Nate Diaz was also a southpaw kind of threw Conor McGregor off, which kind of I was reading something where he had to like really extend his left punch a lot or oh, something like that, or maybe that I don't is, know. I can't remember what I can't remember the technicalities about it. But right, you would know so, more than me. So but. for his division, yeah. McGregor has very long arms. Yeah. He's bigger than everyone he's fought. Yeah. Nate Diaz, though, is the first guy Murder has fought with a reach advantage. Oh, really? Nate Diaz is way taller. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so for the first time. Okay. And um, and he normally has about, it seems like, 10 to 20 pounds on him, too, right? Uh, now, the weight wasn't such a factor. But normal, like, on average, though, if outside of this outside of this fight, right? Uh, I guess so. McGregor loses a lot of weight, though. Oh, really? Like, they showed the pictures side by side, like, uh, when he fought for the 145 pound title in uh, December, yeah, um, he looks like a meth addict. You know, just like <laughs> you can see his ribs. Yeah, yeah. He looks terrible, man. He looks diseased. Oh yeah. But in this one, he's like full. He's like healthy. Chiseled. Um. Yeah. Brad yeah, Pitt. Ripped. Brad Pitt from Fight Club. <laughs> Maybe because I mean, because I mean, honestly, that is the epitome of male physiqueness, in my opinion. Always. Oh, I mean. And it's every man's deep down. They just don't want to accept <laughs> it, to be honest, in my opinion. Because you know? nobody wants to look like a beefcake, you know, like bodybuilders. Like the mountain. The, like, yeah, the mountain. Exactly. So there's a cool video. Have you seen the mountain sparring with Conor McGregor? Wait, the mountain from Game of Thrones? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. How, how am I supposed to see that? <laughs> well, you I mean, that, it viral. quite a best of both worlds based on our conversations tonight. If yeah, you ask man. me, yeah. Yeah, we were just sitting inside. Uh, you are having some beers. I was eating some food. I just got back from training at Jiu-Jitsu. And you went deep, man. You know a lot about Game of Thrones. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> a lot more than I do. No, I'm, it's it's kind of ridiculous. Kinda, so I kind of went from being obsessed about Star Wars and reading about the expanded universe of that and just being obsessed about Game of Thrones in the past couple of years. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's a pastime. It's morphed your, ner- it's a hobby. Morphed your nerdum. Morph, morphed my nerd- nerdery. That's a hard sentence to say, man. Morphed my nerdery. Yeah. Nailed it. Especially like two and a half beers down, it's kind of tough too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we gotta remember not to put the beers on this table. It's loud as fuck. Good light. Okay, so but the thing in Toronto that I really wanted to tell you about. So I went to two comedy shows there. Okay. The first one was just regular. It was a comedy club, comedy corner, I believe it's called. Okay. The Black Room, like uh, the comedy store. That's remember racist. We went to? Yeah. yeah. But okay. <laughs> it's, it's black. It, it's in Canada. The walls are black. The people are not. <laughs> and um, <laughs> no one in Canada is black. That's a statistic. <laughs> and, but, Scientifically proven. But the second place I went to, it's called Vapor Central. It's a bring your own weed bar. Whoa. They have bongs for rent, $5 up to $15, depending on how nice you want it. What's they have the volcanoes to rent. How nice is the nicest bong you can get? Like how tall? Oh, ridiculous. Like absurd. Like, I don't know. I guess like, like too, like too, just like too nice? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. unnecessary. Unnec- okay. the, the cheapest bongs are really good. Wow. Like glass percolators. Wow. Clean. You can see straight through them. They had munchies. I buy airheads. Uh, people were drinking coffee in there. You could drink some stuff. They only had one rule. No, two rules. One of them was hilarious. The other one ruined it. First rule, no pizza boxes. Okay. You cannot bring your own pizza box. Okay. <laughs> Wow, yeah, that's <laughs> wow, that's actually very inconvenient. Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> funny that you can see, like, that wasn't a rule when they first opened, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> they weren't, like, sitting around at the investor <laughs> meeting, like, no pizza boxes. I know. That's We're really having a problem with these problem. goddamn pizza boxes <laughs> yeah. all the time. Yeah. People just walking with pizza. <laughs> I know. No, probably they walk in, they eat their pizza, and then just leave it behind, you know? Mm. Fuck that. And you can't probably. throw pizza boxes away economically. It's just they don't fit in the trash cans. True. So the second rule, though, is no socializing with other customers. Oh. So if me and you walk in there, yeah. we get our own table, we bring our own weed, and they don't want us talking to each other, to other tables, I mean, yeah. because they can't legally sell weed, and they're scared that the customers will begin dealing, oh. which will attract law enforcement. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. it makes sense, but it's very unfortunate. It's very unfriendly in there. But is there a way to get around that? Like sell, you... sell weed themselves. That's what it would have to be. Ah. But because of the law, they're, they're like in a weird bubble, man. Where it, again, it's not legal. Yeah. What they're doing. Yeah. It was described to me by Canadian as civil protest. 
Really? Yeah. That's how I, I met this comedian at the, the... I was up in Toronto for the Princess Cruise Line interview. Yeah. That's why I was there. How did that go, by the way? It was a fucking fun day, man. I've never had a fun interview before. Well, okay. <laughs> did, you get, did you do, like, activities or something yeah, like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What kind of activities? Um, when we first walked in, they had us... They passed around a toilet paper roll. Nice. Didn't tell us why. And just said, take some off. And so then... After his like introductions and stuff, we all just stand up and for each roll, of, uh, for each like what would you say, piece of toilet paper, each square, each square that you, you, had to, you had to say something about yourself. Okay. So everyone there, they're trying to be friendly, and it's like a very um, character-driven job. The job is called event or cruise staff. How many which just means like hosting like games and stuff on the cruise ship, just being like the face, yeah. being the celebrity on board, being um, making sure everyone's having fun. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Acclimating so customers. Stood up. Yeah. Yeah, so everyone stood up and did their best. They told jokes, and like it was really fun. Yeah, I went up there. I told some of my jokes. <laughs> it was cool. Can um, you can you give me some? Can you tell me one or maybe <clears throat> one? Um, yeah, but I mean, you gotta keep in mind like jokes out of context never quite work. So one thing I, I stood up and uh, everyone there was talking about their brothers and sisters. Yeah, some of them weren't that good. Like I have <laughs> one brother. Yeah, and so I stood up. I was like, I have a brother. Uh, we used to fight, but then I learned wrestling, and now he's really nice to me. Um. Oh, That's ones. hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it's funnier context. Like, yeah. um, uh, I majored in accounting and went to Asia immediately to avoid an accounting job. <laughs> yeah. Successfully. Wow. That's like going right into the heart of darkness right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so there's like 30 people there, I guess. Okay. Like four rows of people. Where were you? In a room? Yeah. In a conference room at a hotel by the airport. Okay. Yeah, o- almost all Canadians. <laughs> like, it was like a local interview yeah. that, like, the new person at the company got three Americans there. It was me, a dude from L.A., and a dude from Atlanta. Was that huge? Well, everyone's like, you fucking flew? <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> I know. Everyone was like, Why the fuck are you here? Yeah. <laughs> and we were sort of like, uh, we didn't know. It's like, dude. And, like, that girl, she didn't tell us we were supposed to, like, organize a presentation. Oh, really? Like, everyone else there had, like, a two-minute, like, thing ready to go yeah it was supposed to like teach us something or um you know stand up and inter- entertain for two minutes right get a group going yeah and so it's just fun man like everyone stood up everyone there was super talented at something you know yeah. a lot of the girls like own their own dance studios okay uh, there's a lot of people who've only been djing their whole life never had a job yeah a couple stand-up comedians like really cool people right yeah it's so it was a bit overwhelming in that way which is why I don't think I got the job because like everyone there was like so talented. Was like everybody needed that job and you just wanted it. Um, I don't think that was a factor. I just think everyone there was more. I shouldn't say everyone, but a significant amount were more extroverted than I was. Yeah. You know, there's a couple people there who are like I know I would rank higher than them. Yeah. But I wouldn't put myself in the top ten. Yeah. And they're not looking for that many people. For what's the job. hiring? What's the hiring percentage? How many people were in the room? I say thirty. Thirty. What's yeah. the percentage say that higher? Um, it's hard to say. Ten? They're looking for like five. I don't know how often they do this. That, that's yeah. how it's hard to say. Yeah. They said they have two jobs ready right now, but it's a rotating thing. So the way the job works, man, is it's they have eighteen boats. Wait, two they have two jobs job. ready. Yeah. So two positions opening for thirty people. Uh, not was quite that, or was that two not, positions it's per boat? It's, it's like two positions on a, one boat, and they got like six boats open or something like that? So they have two positions on each of the 18 boats. Okay. And all those people are on six-month contracts. Uh-huh. So it's staggered. Like every month, someone's done. Yeah. Sometimes two people, sometimes four, sometimes six. Yeah. So right now, it's two people are done. They're looking to fill those. But next month, it might be four next month might be six. Are you going to have to fly out every month? No, no, no. I'm done with this company for that. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, I'm on file. Okay. Um, they, I'm sure they made their decision about me. Yeah. But, like, you know, maybe, like, if someone blew them away, they get the first job, and then maybe I get the... You know I mean? I'm, yeah. I'm in the system. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm. But then, um, there's this really uh, uh, particularly social guy. Yeah. And he got everyone organized for lunch. We all went out for sushi afterwards. Nice. And he was staying downtown very close where I was. Yeah. He had an Airbnb there. And so he's like, yeah, you all party tonight? I was like, for sure. He's like, yeah, we're going to the gay bars. And I was like, all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Let's suck it. All right. No one's ever said that to me before. Um, all right. 
<laughs> he's this gay dude from LA. But the type of gay dude where I didn't pick up on it, like even after he said that, I was like, yeah. how did you decide? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what? Why are we? Yeah. Um, all right, yeah, I'm, I'm down. All right. Um, it's a new experience, dude. And so it worked out really well, man, because the, the way Steve Stamper books hotel rooms, he books them all on points. He's gone through Undora, through his work for like all these years to get yeah. a million points. And so they upgraded me to a suite, like completely unnecessarily. So I had this suite in downtown Toronto. Did you bring a dude back? <laughs> so for the pre party, <laughs> um, me, the gay dude, the dude from Atlanta, and two girls from Toronto. Yeah. One of them who the gay dude met on a previous cruise job he had. Okay. And the other girl, I met her in Taiwan. Okay. So they came over, we had some drinks, we went to the gay bars, had a great time, had nice. a blast. Tell me about it. Well, like, how, what was so fun about it? <laughs> Obviously, it was a bunch of guys. It, it's hard to say, man. You know, it's hard to say how much was the environment and how much was, like, us. You know what I mean? Like, the, the crew can make the night, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you can have your own party within the party, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, yeah, just, the, I don't know, man. Well, I've also, I've never been out in Toronto. These past few months, I have not been drinking much. My only experience has really been San Diego. Yeah. Which is not such a friendly place to go out. Yeah, right? really? Especially where I was, in Pacific Beach. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's Is very... Is it kind of um, like Newport? Yeah. Yeah. Very status-driven. <laughs> yeah. Right? If you go there in a suit and with muscles, yeah, people are nicer to you. Yeah. You know? Go there and... Li yeah, exactly. Whereas in Toronto, or in Canada in general, people are nicer, right? Yeah, I mean... You can, you can approach people on the street easier. You got to take this, too. You're in a new town, new people, excited for your job. Yeah. Gay bar. Yeah. Those sweet. Sweet. Yeah. Those five factors right there. Sounds like a great night. Yeah, and the girl I was with, she was cool. Yeah. Uh, I haven't Smash. seen her in a while. Um, yeah, it was just fucking fun, man. Hard to say. So let me ask you this. So over under seven times did you get hit on by another guy? Oh, a thousand. Okay. But like so, subtly. Like okay. not in a, in a intrusive, would that be the right word? Like an intrusive way where that, it's like a problem. Yeah. And no, nothing like that. Nothing rude. Yeah. Um, just a lot of eye contact. Yeah. Which is like a weird thing for me because every time I've been to a bar, not a single person has ever made eye contact with me. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, I know. It, it, it's willful um, ignorance of just like uh, they're not going to look at me. Yeah. You know what I mean? Girls, guys, whoever. Yeah. Like Bartenders. I, <laughs> I feel – yeah, you really have to like go out of your way to kind of set yourself apart like mm -hmm. at, at a normal straight bar. Yeah. But I feel like at gay bars like – it's a bunch of guys, one hooking up with other guys, so they all kind of think the same, so they're all yeah. kind of on the same level. I don't know. Yeah, that's one way yeah. to look at it, man. Uh, it's hard to say, and it was just fun. You know, I had a good time. I got told that the gays love the skinnies. Someone told me that. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> I don't know. I think it was some sort of compliment. What are the skinnies? Are the jeans? Are we wearing skinny jeans? Uh, no. Or just like a skinny like guy. a skinny dude. Oh, yeah. really? Gays love the skinnies. All right. I was wearing a particular sweater that I <laughs> told the gays love. Like I don't know what word he used. Like ribbed. You know what I mean? Like it's like you could uh, like run your fingers across and it feel different. It's textured. Huh. It's like got lines on it. Huh. That's oh. interesting. I don't know. That's interesting. Yeah. It was a really fun night, man. I hung out, but that's why um, I was telling you I, I've been trying to uh, work on my diet this week because I went to Toronto and I drank almost every night. Drank at the gay bar, drank at the UFC, ate you, terrible food. You had quite a healthy dinner tonight. Yeah. And your farts will attest to the healthy diet you had <laughs> earlier today and the, probably yesterday as well. Yeah, man. I'm getting looks because I'm training at 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu now in Costa Mesa, yeah. a place where I don't know anyone. <laughs> shout out, rep, 10th Planet story. Costa Mesa, just <laughs> FYI, if anyone wants to go into Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah, shout out 10th Planet. If you sign up, I get a month free. So, uh, Rex, you want to come? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fourth time you've asked me to come, haven't come yet. Yeah, planning on it. It's gonna be fun, man. That, that's the thing about it. Like, as soon as you make the first trip in, yeah, you're gonna be hooked. Okay, for sure. There's okay. no doubt in my mind. Okay, I'm just waiting for the right time in my life when I want that kind of excursion. You know what the I mean? The right time is now. The moment after you step in. Here and now. 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 Right. Yeah, so I was just telling you about that. Can you tell the people? The Island. Marshall was telling me about the utopian book called The Island, written by, by Aldous Alder Huxley, yeah. which is a contrast to the dystopian book he wrote previously called Brave New World, yeah. which I have read. Did you read Brave New World? Yeah. 
So you've read both of them. Yeah, which I read them back to back. Which did you like better, The Island or Brave New World? They're so different, man. Like, like isn't the right word. Which one? In Brave New World. It's which not one did you? Which one did you? Like, which one would you read again? Island. The Island. Brave New World's heavy. No, I know. I read. I sucks. read Brave New World in AP language arts in oh, my okay. junior year of high school. So I like. Yeah, that that book is insane. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, uh-huh. and even crazier than that, man. I read 1984 right before that, because 1984 and Brave New World are considered pretty similar books. See, I've never. Well, what's interesting? I've never read 1984. Mm. I've. You love it. I'm a little bit disappointed in myself that I haven't read it yet. To be honest. Yeah. You know what's interesting? They read it in regular English my junior year, but they did not read it in AP English my junior year. So I don't. Screwed you out yeah, of it. Yeah, I got fucked out by not being. Too late. I right. got screwed over being an overachiever, you know? Dude, it sucks. It's not too late. Sometimes, man. Yeah, you be careful with your feet there. Oh, coming up on the microphone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this table's too noisy. I know. <laughs> this studio we're in is this. This studio. I know. This outdoor studio. I know. <laughs> the acoustics are just not set right in this yeah. studio right here. Oh, it's also the first podcast where I haven't attempted to record it. Because every podcast I set up a GoPro, and then I get so fucking frustrated trying to get the video onto my tablet. Like, I have a tablet that just can't handle the video. Yeah, it just, can't sh- match it just up shuts down everything, right? Ah, uh, it's so frustrating. Wait, so how, wait, so you tried to do a video audio kind of mm-hmm. deal going? Yeah. Okay. Cause that, that's how Joe Rogan does it. And I, I love watching his videos. Really? Yeah, because there's so much of conversation that's, like, lost and you can't see it. Right? Like, I'm pretty animated with my hands. Did you, have you listened to the one of the most recent Duncan Trussell podcasts about Satanism? I've listened to a couple about Satanism. Okay. I don't think the most the recent The most recent one, one? He has Lucius, the, ma- the main one of the main guys in Satanism. He's been on there before, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, I just listened to it on Sunday, actually, when I was driving down to the Cross Festival. Nice. You should check it out. On a side note, you went to the Cross Festival? I did go to the Cross Festival. How was that? Man? I went to, on Sunday. I, went to the, I was supposed to go Saturday and Sunday, but to buy a two-day pass, I was looking to buy a ticket like last, like, yeah. last minute. As but, you do. But no, normally I buy them ahead of schedule. Actually, As normally, normally I'm like early release. I buy the ticket. But um, with this one, I wanted to wait until like the day before. Mm-hmm. But tickets were like three to four hundred dollars for a two day pass. So I was like, I- I'm just not gonna go. And I was supposed to go because I was supposed to meet like this girl down there that I went to hard summer with. And rape date girl. Mm, no. Sounds like a rape date. Not at all. Back to back rape dates. Yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> not even close, man. We just like made out a little bit at the concert, and that's it. Okay. But um, couldn't find a ticket on Friday. Saturday, I was just like, I'm not gonna go. You know, tickets are still out of control. Sunday morning, I found one a one day pass for ninety dollars. So I drove out to Corona, picked it up, went down. Um, Where was Cross? Was it downtown San Diego? It was on exactly the waterfront park. It was yeah. right. By, it was right by the San Diego Convention Center. Cool. Yeah, it's downtown. Yeah, exactly. Hey, who was playing? Claude Van Stroke. Yes, Hilo, Odessa, Gorgon City. Um, Gorgon City, the band. Or yeah, the, DJ? the band. Full band. The full band. How many there. people are in Gorgon City? Four, five. Really? Five, four. I don't. I was... Yeah, it was a lot of techno. It was a lot of like. I'm a bass head. I like dubstep. I like trap music, you know. Um, but there's a lot of techno and house music, which I'm okay with. So I haven't seen a dubstep show in years, man. In college, it was my favorite thing. I love to go see Nero. That was what I thought was the ultimate. Uh, I've seen Bass Nectar a couple times. I think he's, like, I just use the word ultimate. I don't know. That's no, I use another the word, great the, word. The equivalent is insane. I use, <laughs> the, I use the word insane. Nero's the ultimate. Nero, Bass Nectar's insane. Nero's insane. Ba- but Nero's, what I want to know, yeah. man, is where do I go from here? I haven't listened to dubstep in a while. Uh, what do I do now? Getter. Getter. That's the artist you should listen to. How do you spell Getter? Getter. G e t t e r. Getter. Okay. Getter, Barely Alive, Must Die. Those three guys are probably the key of dubstep right now. See, I'm so excited because I don't know any of these. No, yeah. Like, you're... <laughs> I almost feel like I should just go to a show. Have you Because, heard... like, listening to dubstep at home is rough. Have man. you... Have you? No, you're no, you're right. Dubstep like, only... I can't do it Dubstep the sounds anymore. the best when it's live. But have you heard... You've, have you heard of Suh, dude? Uh-uh. Suh, dude. 
You've never seen, you've never heard of Sa Dude? No, I've been out of the scene for three years. No, this is like this is like like within the past like couple months. Okay. Like okay, so it's a seven second video on oh. YouTube. It's okay. seven, it's, dude. <laughs> I was another DJ. No, 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 no. The well, the DJ Getter is a part of why this video became viral. Okay. Like he's half of it, but okay. like it's a seven second video, and this guy named Getter helped make it or whatever. This other guy named uh, Nick Coletti. But so what? I'm gonna play it right now. That's it. Okay. That's all of it. <laughs> so there's, but there's two guys that's, just saying "sa dude." Yeah. That's getter. That's getter. Okay. But I just, I, just, I don't know. Side note. I just that's you know I'm just a little you know it's a side note right there. But that guy makes the best dubstep right now. Okay. I was talking with Eric this past weekend, and Eric thinks that Getter Ghost Produce, which writes yeah. music for Skrillex behind the scenes, because a lot of this new sound that Skrillex is coming out with right now sounds a lot like the stuff that Getter has been making. Okay. So, this is, I mean, this is Eric's opinion. Yeah, it's conspiracy it's theory. It's conspiracy theory, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I mean, like... It's not if, possible Skrillex is just a fan and knows how, the process. Like, Eric's thinking behind it is that Skrillex is at such a high level right now, uh -huh. and he's such, you know, the focal point, the apex of that Does scene. he headline everything he does now? Yeah, he's Jack Always. Yeah, he's... Yes, he does. Okay. Yeah, and so, like, he doesn't have time to write music all the... Because he's touring, and he's performing shows, and he's writing... He's doing stuff for Jack U, and he's performing with Diplo, right, and, like, all this right. kind of shit. He's got a lot of side projects. So he's, <clears throat> I'm sure he's got a lot of side projects that he doesn't have time to complete. So dog, he has. Is Dogblood still a thing? No, it's not. Dogblood hasn't been a thing for a couple, like a year and a half. Okay. Years. I, I, okay, they, I like Dogblood. I like Dogblood too. Dogblood is great. Like, Dogblood, like, I think they came out with a song recently or they had like one or two shows the past couple months recently. Okay. But they're not as good as they used to be. Right. Dude, I need to go to the bathroom. Okay, yeah. We're talking about okay. Rex Nelson has peed. We're back. I have urinated efficiently. How was it? It's good? Relieving. It's relieving? I feel like I have so many words to speak now. Yeah? Yeah. You had a lot of words before, man. I can't even imagine. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> nice word. <laughs> um, but what I was thinking about while you're gone, man, is like the reason that the place in Toronto, the, the Bring Your Own Weed place, was so mind-blowing to me is because I have in a notebook that exact place mapped out. I Where? thought about this in um, like months ago. I was thinking about because we have a buddy, a good buddy of ours, Connor. He's up in Oregon. He's deep in the weed industry right now. He's got a farm. He's got, I don't know what all he's got. Dude, he's one of the trilogy. Dispensary. Dude. Yeah. Trilogy. One of the trilogy. My part. Yeah, my part of the trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> I mean. All right. So we all grew up on Orange Avenue, within <laughs> five blocks of each other. I mean. So I just learned that the trilogy is me, Rex Nelson, and Connor Lucky. And so once he started telling me about it, he tried to get me, uh, you know, I went up there and trimmed with him, right. did a little bit of work with him. And as soon as he told me about that, I designed this exact, you know, Situation, smoking scenario. weed in a cafe with booze, t booths, not booze. <laughs> um, That's a key difference right there. Very big. Very huge very difference, big. actually. But the difference between my place and this place is I would serve high quality tea. Okay. Of course. Okay. Really good Chinese tea. You know what, though? Okay. This might be just me. It is. But the hot tea with the inhalation, the smoke, didn't mix well for me last time. See, I disagree entirely. But, I think it's point a noted. I think it's a preference, and I think it's a, what you grew up on. Okay. Point noted. We can have cold tea available. Okay. I know how to make really good iced tea. All right. Okay. It's really easy. Hey. Crisis averted. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, let's do it. All right, sign me up. All right, sold. You know, I don't need much more after that. See, if we can please me and you, I think we can please everybody. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> you know, actually, I don't know. We're pretty fucking easy to please. Think so? so? Yeah, I do actually. Who's someone not easy to please? What would we need to do? For Morgan. Them? Morgan Lynch. Yeah. <laughs> the hardest guy to please. Mike Daly. You know why though? <laughs> Mike Daly. Because Morgan's a ginger. Yeah, you're right. It must be hard to please when you don't have a soul. But even worse than that, he's a ginger denier. Oh, you're right. He's he might be denial. listening right now, 
And if, if he is, he heard me say he's a ginger, and out loud, he's by himself in my imagination, out loud he went, no, I'm not! Yeah, dude. Which makes it even worse. I'm not in denial, but... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> hey, am I right? <laughs> Can I get a witness? All right. <laughs> yeah. And then the second person he said, Mike Daly, he's never coming to this place. Mm. He, he's a bit anti-weed. Yeah. On principle. And I went to his house a couple months back, and um, tried to make him tea. He didn't have any. He had two sodas in the meantime that I was <laughs> making tea. <laughs> so you're right. He's, he's hard to please in the sense that he'll never step foot in this imaginary place. In this studio, yeah. <laughs> this brilliant, yeah. Wait, does Morgan smoke? Yeah. Consistently? I don't know. He smokes with me. Dude, I'd love to smoke with Morgan. Yeah, he's around, man. He's in uh, Orange County. He's just hard to get in, t- in contact with, and he's always with his girlfriend. Hey, give me his phone number, and I'll just start, like, randomly texting him. For sure. He would love I, it. I, I won't tell him it's me for the first while. Oh, I'd perfect. Like, hey, man. Hey, what's up, dog? Send him some gay shit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Met you a while back. Send him some BBCs. What's a BBC? I don't know. Big, brown, cockroaches. <laughs> That's probably what I'd say. <laughs> you said cockroaches? Yeah, there's pictures of cockroaches. Big black cockroaches. <laughs> <laughs> or just some clitor eye. Some what? Big black clitor eye. <laughs> yeah. Multiple clitor eye. Big black coons. Coons? Coons. Oh, you can't say that. Uh, that was 16. <laughs> you can't call them coons. So, wait, so what else? Wait, so, how was. So, when you flew into Toronto, yeah. like, what was the first thing you did in Toronto? First thing I did in Toronto, it's probably not eventful. I took a train into the city. What's the most memorable thing you did in Toronto? Um, I don't know, man. It's like a tie for... Like, the three things I did that were so fucking cool were the interview, yeah, the UFC, because this was like a historic UFC. Two champions fell. Two people. The girl who Holly beat... Holly Holmes. Holly right? Holmes yeah, lost, dude. man. In one of the most epic fights of all time. I say that a lot... And it's always true. Yeah. This fight, man, the second round, she almost got strangled, right? right. Mushi Tate took her down, pounded her out, punched her a lot. Because Holly Holmes is a striker, right? She's a kickboxer. Yeah. She wants to fight on her feet. Yeah. Misha Tate's a wrestler. Yeah. So second round, Misha Tate took her down, punched her face in, took her back, almost choked her, and amazingly, Holly Holmes got to her feet. Third round and fourth round... Holly Holm kicked the shit out of Misha Tate. Yeah. Won those rounds decisively. Yeah. Fifth round, the minute and a half left, Misha Tate took down Holly Holm, took her back. Holly Holm tried to get her off in a very good, like a good technical way. way. Misha Tate, after fighting for 23 and a half minutes, yeah. you can imagine how exhausting that is. I can I can't. I can imagine it's like running, sprinting, racing for 20 minutes. I, I imagine it's closer to a marathon. That's how I always uh, pictured it. Like, a marathon's like too... It's not quite humanly possible. Fighting for 25 minutes not quite humanly possible. But people do. Yeah, that's a long-ass time to fight. I never fucking realized that, actually. So long. Yeah. And Misha Tate held on to the neck in a way that I've never been able to do. She just held on like how? glue. Like, like, what, like, like, like so she, her arm was under Holly Holm's neck, yeah. and her other arm came over the top. Yeah. Holly Holm flipped, which should toss Misha Tate, like, across the room. Yeah. Misha Tate held on <sighs> amazingly. She under her, was she under her chin? Under her chin. I believe so. Okay. Oh, Rose close. Because that's, like, the only way she could do that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then choked her with a minute left in a fight she was going to lose. Amazing. And it's like a success story, man. Like, Misha Tate was the champion before Ronda Rousey came on the scene. Oh, really? You know what I mean? She was like the, the head girl. Yeah. And then Ronda's just too good. They fought twice. Um, Ronda broke Misha's arm. Really? Yeah. Wh- Snapped what? it. Wait, which bone? The elbow. I Where? Don't know. Like here? Like at the elbow. Like she got her an arm bar. Like Misha Tate did back. not tap and came up. Her elbow came up. All Hyper right. extended. All right, moving on. All right. And then afterwards, right. so, so for the Conor McGregor fight, to give you an idea of how big Conor McGregor is, everyone in the bar was chanting McGregor. Who did he beat to get to this level? Jose Aldo. That's right. right. Jose Aldo is a champion for 10 years. All right, all right, the right. most dominant fighter. That was like the huge, big-ass uh, upset. Amazing. 13 seconds. 
Yes, yes. Yeah. That's how long the fight was. That right? is a legitimate miracle. Yeah. No, I remember and that. then, so before this fight, we're at Hooters, a silly place to be at, you know? Nah. But it's like the company we were with, like, um, and so the manager comes up to us, and he's yeah. like, who do you guys think's going to win? Yeah. Like, Nate Diaz. And he's like, you guys are the only table in here. Yeah. So we're, it's going to the fight, and the people at the table, they kind of take it seriously. Like, I never root for someone in a fight, right? Like, I don't really give a fuck who wins. I want a good fight. Unless it's WWE. <laughs> and you always root for the Undertaker, right? Yeah. Or Rey Mysterio. But my point is, look, so I pick Nate Diaz just because throughout his career, I've never picked Conor McGregor. He always puts himself in these impossible situations, and thus far he's prevailed. Yeah. But every single time I look at him going, no, you can't beat Chad Mendes. He did. Yeah. No, there's no way he's going to beat Jose Aldo. He did. He did. There's no way he's going to beat Nate Diaz. That's my, that's my my logical <laughs> my logical <laughs> thing. Yeah. So, I, but I don't really care. You know, first round, Conor McGregor's winning, as I said, and I'm stoked. Yeah. I'm like, if he does this, he's hands down the greatest thing to ever happen to the earth. Pound for pound, right? Pound for pound, the greatest thing to happen on earth. Yeah. Better than milk. Better than quinoa. Better than these lights that are illuminating us in this beautiful backyard. What about Call of Duty? He's better than Call of Duty Two. Uh, Black no, no, Ops. No, 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 no. Than... <laughs> We're talking about GameCube, Dave. You know, Medal of Honor, whatever the fucking one that had D Day on it. Okay, he's up there. Okay, it's it's a close call. But well, anyway, would he so the... give himself the username Fruitcock? Would he or would he not? Because that is the deciding factor right there. He would never call himself Fruitcock. Okay, okay, all right, but all right. if he I left got it much the more bathroom, in I got a much more perspective. Right. <laughs> if he went to the bathroom while it was time to choose a name, we might, as a goof, put his name as Fruitcock. But would we throw grenades at the ground for about fifteen lives? No. Okay. To Conor McGregor? Yeah. No, we wouldn't do that. So we just change his name. Anyway, Continuing. the fight's going on. I don't care who's winning. People at the table are kind of like, Diaz, no! <laughs> as if it fucking matters. As if, like, this is our friend. You know what I mean? No. Like, as if we, like, <laughs> no one's betting money on it. My boy! Diaz, no! My <laughs> ego. It's all ego, right? It's yeah. got to be like, I told Rex that Diaz is going to win. Therefore, if he doesn't, I look like a fool. That's kind of logic. I don't, I don't care about that at all, man. I make wrong bets all the time. I, I don't, don't bet. care. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so Nate Diaz wins the fight, and the guy behind us stands up and goes, fuck you guys. <laughs> like to you, right? Yeah. Like three inches from my head. Yeah. And I'm standing yeah. up, man. I wanted to flip a table. You it was the most exciting thing I've ever seen. I've had a couple of beers in me. At the time, as well as right now, yeah, I'm getting excited right Same. now. My my heart is pounding. Same. <laughs> Same. And so I'm standing up. I'm going, oh my god! You know, normal things in such a historic, amazing moment as this. Yeah. An amazing moment that I've only seen produced by the UFC. A moment that Hollywood can never reproduce. Yeah. If this isn't a movie, it would not be that amazing. I want to ask you this. Okay. Which moment was greater? This moment you just described, or after, or 14 seconds after Conor McGregor won that last fight he was in. Very similar. Not 13, 14 seconds. Very similar. Both times, I was drunk in public, and I wanted to flip a table. Okay. But for the, the, the one where he fought Jose Aldo, I started a chant in the bar. There's a chant that Brazilian fans do. They go... Oh, okay, boy, so yeah. with that one, so oh, with that first boy, one, yeah. you wanted McGregor to win, right? No, I don't really care, man. Okay. I just thought Jose Aldo would win. Yeah, and for this one, you thought Conor McGregor would win, right? No. You thought Diaz would win? That's what I'm saying, man. I always think McGregor can't do it. Dude, why do you not bet? Money? Because I've lost so many times. I don't except have any money, for, man. I haven't for, worked in the last. Except for the one where Conor McGregor won. <laughs> Because I don't have any money, man. I knew to why. <laughs> <laughs> but you're a guy with a job. Like, I don't have yeah, job Yeah, but I'm, I'm so much in debt that I don't <laughs> have any money. All right? Like, 80% of my paycheck goes to the debt I have from college. All right? Fair like, enough. Yeah. So you understand. Like, yes. It, be, I bettings do. Are, uh, what they say about betting is you have to bet the money you're okay with losing. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? You have to be like, yeah, I don't really care either way. Yeah, I don't have any. That's money. the only position any, to I bet money I'm on. A, I'm out of a bag of pennies. I'm, yeah. I'm like, yeah. So the next is, time we can bet a bag of pennies. This is like 60 cents. Yeah. Eh. I'll bet you 60 cents on the next fight. All right. I got Mark Hunt. He's fighting Frank Mir. All right, I got Frank Mir. Fair enough, man. Cents, it's a good dude. bet. Hey, Frank Mir's going to win. Frank Mir's good. He might. Yeah, he is. <laughs> and at the same time, man, if Frank Mir pulls it off, how amazing is that? You should probably just pay me the $1. twenty now. <laughs> 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 but there's a quote by uh, by Dana White that I love because they always accuse him of fixing fights. You Frank know? who? Dana White. He's the president of the UFC. Oh, I didn't know He's that. the most invested in the UFC, right? Are you going to drink that? No, this last one's for you. Oh, cool. But so anyway, they, anytime something amazing happens, they accuse him of fixing it. They're like, oh, so you paid Conor McGregor to take this dive. You paid Anderson Silva to get knocked out. And he, his response every time that I love, and I agree with this 100%, is he says, the reality of the fight is always better than any scripting. There's no way you could write it better than it happened. There's no That's way you could true. write the yeah. Nietzsche Tate ending better. Yeah. It was perfect. Yeah. The perfect ending. And now, Ronda Rousey is back in the picture. She is? She is. She's back, man. She's going to fight Misha Tate. Dude, Supposedly. We'll see. I heard that Holly Holmes, like, the fact that she lost to Misha Tate, like, missed out on an incredible opportunity to, like, fight Ronda Rousey. Like, They're going to fight still. Yeah. But it's like, not these gonna, aren't it's old not... people. They're not. Yeah. These are the, by far the top three. There's a couple other girls, but not really. But, there's a couple other girls, but they're girls, so. <laughs> <laughs> these three are, these like, are women. These three are like half dudes, all right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, the opinions of Rex Nelson are not the opinions of the Tales in the Cock podcast. Um, and a lot of no, bad, but what I'm saying is, you know, these three girls <laughs> could probably kick yours and my ass at Easily. the same time. Easily. One of these girls could kick yours and my ass at the same Any time. Any girl in the UFC. And there is a girl in the UFC who trains at 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu. Did you fight her? No. Why not? Because there's a thing in Jiu-Jitsu where you don't challenge someone better than you. If if she came up to me and said, would you like to roll? I'd say, of course. So you just like, so Jiu-Jitsu, you just pick on all the weaklings? It's it's more polite to go to someone worse than you. Hey. <laughs> hey, I'm going to, so it's like, hey, I'm going to give you the chance to prove yourself against me. And it's not about proving, it's about... She has more at risk than I do. If I injure her, oh yeah, okay, she's out of her career. She has more to lose, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. In the same way, oh, a black yeah. belt, you yeah. don't go. Black belts are always injured. Yeah, it's rude for me to go up and be like, "I challenge you." Why are black belts always? Why are they always injured? Because they had to go through so many wars to get that black belt. Uh, it's almost more than the body can handle. Yeah. In the same way, I'm sure you had coaches in all. You're an athlete guy. An athlete type of guy. Yeah, I'm sure all your coaches had some sort of injury just from being around the sport for so long. You know, it's, they had bad knees. You know what's something. funny? Actually, is that um, my coach in college. So he ran in high school. He ran in college. He was doing marathon running mm-hmm. after college. He, uh, the thing that took him out of the, his running career was he was actually putting the Christmas lights up on his house, and he heard the phone ring inside. <laughs> so he jumped off the ladder and blew out his knee. There you go. That's exactly. So it would be rude for you to challenge this guy to a race. Yes. Knowing that he blew out his knee. And knowing, and also he's got about 40 years of life on top of me. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah physically, I just wouldn't be there. Yeah. So that's built into jiu-jitsu. I shouldn't go up to Carla Esparza. Former UFC champion, by the way. We should. And be like, can I try to strangle you, please? Nah, dude. dude. <laughs> no. Nah, you, nah, you got it. Now nah, you got it, dude. I mean, I'm I'm still not going to. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what you say. So I don't know how long we've been doing this, man, but I think it's about time to um, sign off. I think we talked for over an hour. It's possible. It, usually you can tell by this uh, timer here, but... With the I pee think break, be- I don't really know. I think before my pee-, pee break, it was like right around like 40 minutes. Okay, so yeah, now it's been about 20. And then this one's about s- almost 17. Uh, all right, bro. Um, you Wait, have a we- song to play us off with? Uh, let's see. I know you got a phone nearby. Oh, yeah. Okay. I got I got a good song. Uh, actually, I don't have my phone on me. 
What? But you just we're had gonna, it. We're gonna you watch the video. We're gonna focus John Denver, uh, Rocky Mountain High. Okay, can you sing for us? He was born in the summer of his 27th year. Coming home to a place he'd never been before. Yeah. Rocky Mountain High. And that's yeah, not how it yeah, goes, yeah, but yeah. it's kind of like how it goes. <laughs> it's like, fooled me, man. Like, I skipped, like, probably, like, a whole verse, but, you know. It's West weird. Virginia. West Virginia, <laughs> Mountain Mama. That's actually a different song. Take me home. That's Country Roads. Country Roads. West Virginia, Mountain Mama. <laughs> Take me home, my country roads, country roads, country roads, country roads. I, I literally, I only know the Pretty Lights version of that song. I haven't heard that song before. You'd love it. Dude, have you seen Pretty Lights? Several times. Same. Several times. I've Always tremendous. Yeah, I've never, Always I've never really been disappointed. I haven't been disappointed by anything Pretty Lights has done. I will say... Any song, any performance, true. any Facebook update. <laughs> I will say... He's the man. The last time that I saw Pretty Lights, or actually... Yeah, the last time I saw Pretty Lights was at EDC 2015. So this cool. past EDC. Um, the only thing was, like, I was coming up on a roll really well, and I was with Yusuf Farfan. My favorite. And we were sitting down at his set at the Cosmic Bend. It was like the big grass field. Mm-hmm. And we were just having a conversation the entire time during the set. So I missed beautiful. all of it. Yeah, but it was beautiful. No, you didn't miss it. You were there. No, yeah, I was, you're it right. It worked out perfectly. You're right. No, I, was, I had a great Pretty Light set. By you're having... more there than some people. You were here and now, uh, but then. Here and now. <laughs> here and now. Here and now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was here and now. I also just realized we never quite explained the here and now thing. We can't start talking about Brave New World. So, oh no, we talked about... We introduced it. We introduced the podcast with The Island and Brave New World. And Marshall told me tonight that in the book The Island, the birds, their call, their squawk is here and now. They're parrots. They've the been parrots, this. yeah, and, and the here and now, the words here and now is to remind the, habitant, the inhabitants of the island to stay in the here and the now. And I think that is a great message to end this on. Anybody listening, the future will happen. The past, the past done. has happened. Make Be sure here you are and here and make sure you are now. Whether that's listening to Pretty Lights or talking to Yusef. Satnam. Both are here. Both are now. Satnam. Sometimes. Satnam. Excuse me? Satnam. Okay, well, see ya. Satnam.